Vertical clutch, column wheel, automatic, hacking, hand winding. These are all words we love to hear, the basis of a robust, easy to wear and well-made chronograph. This in a few words is the Longines Navigation Big Eye. It's a watch that I've been following for a long time, made several talking points and videos around it in the past, and truth be told, I never considered the thought of owning one, but always did admire it. When thinking about the subject of chronographs, especially in the reissue category, the big eye, always was around there somewhere. You know, the kind of watch that is on the tip of your tongue in conversation. And over the last few years, to me at least, it seemed as if they had faded into obscurity. Honestly, I believed that they had a very short run and were discontinued a year or so after their release. They weren't easy to source on the second-hand market, and nobody was talking about them. In a strange twist of fate, they are not only still around, but we've just seen the recent release of this model in titanium. And you know when it just happens. Nothing inspired me to go out looking for this watch. The opportunity arose to pick one up at an excellent discount one evening, and I couldn't pass on it. My rationale was that, obviously, I needed to add an automatic chronograph in the collection. And after experiencing it, the watch is by far one of my best purchases to date. Ironically, this watch has suddenly gained a lot of attention and interest on social media and on this platform. So I've owned the Big Eye now for almost three months, a bit unusual of me to have a watch and not share the initial excitement or even share the watch on the channel. I had planned to run a review after about a week, but instead decided to savor the honeymoon period and not rush into this review. More than anything, having a longer time with it has forced me to be a lot more critical. And even after wearing this piece on alternating straps almost daily, it's incredibly difficult to find faults with it. But in a nutshell, design, execution, final presentation, this has to be one of the best value for money Swiss automatic chronographs on the market today. There, review over. Okay, before getting into the actual unboxing thoughts, opinions, a quick look at the Longines Heritage Collection. There are no better brands out there that have such a broad repertoire and collection of past references to bring forward as reissues. The plain answer is that it's difficult to find a watch company today that has such a varied portfolio, one that is not afraid to take risks and one that is willingly open to share its past successes with meaningful recreations. As of now, the current CEO has mentioned that the company plans on using this method and doubling down on recreating these classics in the future. And it's a brilliant business model, more power to them. At the time of this recording, a new example of the Heritage Classic has just been unveiled with a black and brushed slate sector dial. The interest in reissues or pieces inspired by the past has never been greater, and along with a few others like the Heritage Diver, the Big Eye was one of the first in this category. What's quite funny about this model in particular is that nobody knows where it comes from. The story goes that the collector bought the watch to Longines for a service, and they had never seen the likes of it before. There have been a few instances in the Swiss watch industry like this, where collectors share their watches with manufacturers and they decide to remake them. But in the case of the Avigation Big Eye, there is virtually no record of it ever being made. Longines themselves acknowledge that they don't even know how old the watch is. Some assume it's a design from the 1930s, but we saw a large prominence of the Type 20 aesthetic being used by the military in the 50s, all the way until the 70s. This is all covered in the Watches of the French Armed Forces video that will be linked in the corner of the screen. Basically, there is a 40-year long gap where we guess this watch fits in, and like other rare examples out there, made in small batches between 30 and 60 watches. This could have been a prototype, for all we know. There were no specific hallmarks or anything assigned to it, but judging how the watches used to be made back in the day, we know that they were all manufactured by separate houses. So these dials did share the same manufacturer with Breguet's, etc. of their time. So my belief is that this watch falls into the 50s to the 70s era, where the Type 20 and the extremely scarce examples of the Big Eye configuration were chosen by manufacturers like Breguet with the CEV and Breitling with the 765. We will compare the designs of these later. It's always quite daunting spending a lot of money on a watch, sight unseen. Especially when you read the spec sheet and realize that it's not exactly the typical size of watch you gravitate towards usually. But the box arrived, very impressive as a package, loved the small detail of the polished plaque at the base of the box, just that alone shows you how much the brand cares about these small details. A criticism we could make is that the box is pretty large and would maybe feel a lot more refined if it was smaller and a bit more compact. 
the grandeur and the attention to detail wouldn't be lost if the box was smaller, especially when you notice the attention that went into the elements like the hinges. Underneath the box, in a hidden compartment, you find a small hardcover book, and I found it completely by accident. Inside it are amazing illustrated photographs covering the history of Longines and their partnership with pioneering aviators of the 20th century, names like Amelia Earhart, Charles Lindbergh, Howard Hughes. Such a history that I had no idea about. And at the back of the book, they cover the heritage collection, spotlighting all of the notable models in their lineup. This shows a great care for their products. It is by no means a cheap book to manufacture in bulk, especially as a hardcover. And you can tell that lots of time went into piecing all of this rich history together. Essentially a miniaturized coffee table book given with all of their models. Do they need to do this? Not at all. Does it add value to the experience? Yes, much more than we could imagine. Instead of the product simply being presented beautifully, it's the background that keeps you engaged, more invested, and I think other brands could learn from this. First impressions, I was surprised by its size. It looked pretty huge for 41 millimeters. First thoughts that came to mind before even taking it out of the box was, can I pull this off? 40 millimeters is generally my sweet spot. Of course, visually the watch looked big because it's virtually all dial with a smaller than average stepped bezel. For interest's sake, the dial and the crystal measure 36 millimeters in diameter, so you could fit a date just inside the face of this watch. Lug to lug length measures 49 millimeters. Case thickness is 14.7 or something, thanks to the lovely boxed sapphire. How daunting do the dimensions sound for those of us who are pretty slim wristed? Well, tell you what though, Pay no attention to the size of this watch. If there's one thing for you to take away from my experience with it, its proportions are spot on. I don't like using the word perfect often, but the dimensions here are spot on perfect. Relationship between the lug width, length, case dimensions, without question, it is one of the best wearing watches I own, purely because of how excellent the proportions are. And it's all down to how the watch is scaled. More on that later. If the case height is an issue for you, you'll be luckier if you have a flat wrist because the majority of its height comes from the case back and it disappears when it is on the wrist. Realistically, the case wears more like it's 13 millimeters thick. Before looking at the watch in more detail, let's address how the size of the case and its components make sense for its application. Too often today, we see oversized watches that don't take their sizes seriously. Many are big for the sake of it, with no intention to fill up the open space on the dial or utilize it properly. We think of the big eye's purpose, an aviation chronograph, an instrument to be worn over clothing. To be as legible as possible with stark contrast, easy to understand subdials, easily distinguishable hands, well allocated components with nothing that feels superfluous. I believe this model nails every aspect of that brief. For an aviator's chronograph, the dimensions speak volumes about its purpose and application. But how can we define a watch like this? It's not as basic as just calling it a chronograph. It actually feels like three watches in one, a pilot watch, a field watch, and a chronograph. The real genius around this design, whether the Type 20, the Hanhart specifics, is that it fulfills all of these criteria in one way or another. And that is maybe why it spoke to me so much as a designer. It possesses lots of traits that I love about watches. A great size, clean layout, no irrelevant information, extremely legible. The use of numerals on the dial, and as an added bonus, the underlying quirk that gives it its name. More than anything, I believe it negates many of the legibility issues that plague modern chronographs we see today. Being very easy to read from any angle, behind its purpose of being an instrument, it also has many other qualities. Okay, addressing the subdials and the balance, asymmetry they share across the dial, do they actually work? Especially when paired with the cut-off numerals. It's taken some time to think about this. First, what is the point of the big eye dial? Good question. Many just shrug it off as a quirk but there are some valid points when and where it could be applicable when you're flying. Here are a few examples. Standard turn time, or ROT, rate one turn, also known as a two minute turn, is a maneuvering reference defined as a three degrees per second turn. Basically, in order for an airplane to perform a full 360 degree rotation, it requires two minutes of timing. The big eye with its larger dial would be very easy to read for this purpose. It could be used to time intervals while checks are being made on the aircraft. For timing, especially with older planes like the priming of pumps for fuel, which can take a minute or more, 
or just simply keeping track of how long you are on the ground, preparing everything before taking off. How about quickly calculating how much fuel is left in your tank while using an afterburner? Believe it or not, this is still very important today for jet pilots to know their fuel levels, especially when they're using so much of it. And a lot of the time it's quicker to calculate this manually. Another use, completely different, is that international phone calls would be billed every three minutes back in the day. Like with any chronograph, they are used to time stints an allocated period of work. And there are realistically so many applications when it would be useful. Where is the majority of the focus on the dial? Of course, the big eye has the most amount of presence. There is a dominance taken up on the right side of the watch when we look at how the large pushes, crown, cutoff numerals, and subdial use a lot of space. This asymmetry could be irritating for some who prefer balance, and to others, this breaking of the dial makes it look much more charming. The more I've looked at it, considered whether I like or dislike the cutoff numerals and how they pair with the subdials, for all the bizarreness this arrangement has, it totally works. And in a moment you will see how this compares to other Swiss competitors in this field. But if we are to go ultra nerd, notice how the 2 and the 4 are relatively small and don't take up a lot of space, especially by how they are cut by the big eye dial. Look across to the running seconds dial. Notice how the 10 and the 8 are larger and take up more of the area. Instead of fixing your attention to the big eye dial, look around it and notice that the numerals actually create a balance that's fairly subliminal, where one side is dominated by the larger dial, the other is taken up by more numerals. Realistically, this was a happy accident and not a part of the design intent, but it works very well. To the chronograph function and operation, it uses an automatic ETA caliber that I believe was specifically made for Longines. And the action is sharp, precise, snappy. What we all expect from a column wheel. The pushes need to be properly engaged. And there is a lot of tactile feedback from them when they are used. And compared to most chronos out there which have similar styled hands, there is a nice visual display to take in. The teardrop counterbalance of the chronograph running seconds hand. Something reminiscent of 30s aesthetics. Pointed sword-styled hands on the chronograph minute and hour hands, both are different sizes. Then the watch's hour and minute hands, perfectly sized pencils, all of which have been matte rhodium plated, I believe. And throughout the process of running the chronograph, time telling is extremely easy. Let's be honest, the watch can be read from across the room. One element on the dial that you have to learn to read is the big eye. A 30 minute counter divided up with larger three minute intervals. It took me about a month of practice to read it easily, and it does offer some great benefit when you're wanting to read the running minutes quickly. Another thing to add is that aviation chronographs generally always have hours fully featured on their subdials. This is very useful. The expression mission timer is thrown around a lot. But for day-to-day -day tasks like driving from point A to point B, even flying a distance, being able to quickly see how many hours have elapsed at a glance is excellent. The closing points around this watch, let's take in more of the details. There are lots that haven't been covered through this video, like how the entire case is brushed, very practical for an instrument. There is in fact a very fine bezel that surrounds the crystal that is polished, and when tilting the watch at an angle, you can see that it's technically a stepped case. The boxed sapphire crystal has a thin layer of anti-reflective coating on the underside, and it's the best I've ever experienced. There's no sign that is even applied. Regardless of where the watch is held, no glare whatsoever. The lugs, in a different style to most, stem from the center of the case, which is true to the traditional style of the Type 20 chronographs and the case designs of that time. Notice how they have an eagle beak shape to them. The crown has a radially embossed logo and name on it, which is gorgeous. It's non-screw down and has a very satisfying wind. The case back is nicely detailed, a radial fluting and what looks like a classic observation aircraft in the center. The typeface on the dial is well sized, balance, out of the way and gives you all the information that you would ever need to know. At each point on the dial where the numerals are placed, there is a defined square that accentuates them and the squares are even used at the quarters where no numerals are set, giving the dial a more balanced look. The seven and five numerals have captivating character traits like serifs. Each subdial has its own unique character trait of dots and dashes, using alternative line weights and thicknesses. They can be more mesmerizing than anything else on the dial. As you can probably tell, this watch, like any field or pilot watch, works with all sorts of strap configurations. The strap the watch comes with is decent, but the color pairing could be better addressed. 
The two leather straps that you have been seeing I source from WatchGecko, both under the contoured Italian handmade leather range, quite a mouthful, with quick-release spring bars. Excellent quality and worth the price. And when it comes to downsides, there are only two minor deal breakers that I've found. The first is that the rotor is heavy, and you can feel it spinning on your wrist through the case back. It doesn't make a sound, but there is definitely feedback when the watch is winding. After it's fully wound, the rotor motions decrease, and the feeling is not that apparent. The only other downside is the loom. It's not that potent, which is unfortunate. If it used any form of superluminova, this watch would be a beacon on the wrist. And if there's one change I would like to make, it would be to boost the strength of it. No change is made to the proportions of the watch, case height, thickness. It all works so well. For a quick look at the so-called competitors and models that offer similar aesthetics to the big eye, there are a handful on the market that come to mind. The Hanhart 417, Breguet Type 20 Erinvale, Breitling 765 AVI, and the Blancpain Air Command. They all share that gorgeous Avigation chronograph style but are priced differently and have advantages and disadvantages of their own. Many have in-house movements, some even with a flyback feature, a big bonus, but adds to the expense. Others have bi-compax arrangements which aesthetically look good, but are limiting for those of us who want to use chronographs to calculate hours. Now yes, the purist would be gunning for the Hanhart. Watch my French Armed Forces video for more details. The diehard would love a Breguet Type 20, because it's a Breguet, and it's beautiful. Dare I say the two advantages that the Longines Big Eye has over these is its price, but also the fact that it looks more modern with the pencil-styled hands and the lack of any kind of faux patina, no polishing on the surfaces, while also injecting an informal and fun persona into the mix. Could we say that it's a watch that looks built for purpose, has a serious intent, but doesn't take itself seriously? There's a playfulness. The new release of this model in titanium, who knows if it will be as popular as the original, it definitely adds more vibrancy to a fairly serious model, and the new lightweight case is a fantastic idea, further emphasizing the advancement of materials used in aircraft today. There is a great reflection with the materiality of the watch. As a conclusion to this long-winded talk, I will say that my experiences with the Big Eye has shown me how easily a watch like this can integrate itself into a collection. From the very day I received it and wore it, swapped out straps, I knew that it would be staying in the collection. There's too much to enjoy at once. And let's be real, it's an oversized field watch with an added chronograph complication. There are many like it out there, but the scale, proportions, attention to detail and competency of how well it has been packaged, how well it wears. It is by far one of the best value for money Swiss made chronographs on the market today. A superbly designed chronograph. A piece of aviation history that has no real ties to any one decade, but rather has a prototypical feel to it. All I can say is pay attention to this watch, because they are out there still. The Big Eye is very much worth your time.